Welcome to the Living the Dream Podcast with Curveball. If you believe, you can achieve. Hello and welcome to another episode of Living the Dream with Curveball. I am your host, Curveball, and today I am joined by former baseball player, transformed into a life and business coach. And we're going to be talking about his story today, David Kissy. David, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Curveball. I appreciate it. Why don't you start off by giving everybody a little bit of background on yourself, where you're from, and any other things that you want the listeners to know about yourself? Sure. Yeah. Well, first of all, it's an honor to be here with you. I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, uh, David Kesey, living in Southern California in a place called Santa Clarita, just north of Los Angeles. And uh, I basically am a business and high performance coach for for uh, business leaders and athletes. Okay, so um, let's talk about your baseball career first. You yeah. mentioned that you knew you wanted to play baseball at eight. Kind of run us through that and, and how you knew that and, and just kind of let us know about your baseball career because you were pretty yeah. good. I was okay. You know, <laughs> I, I played for most of my life up till about the age of 27, 28. Um, and you know, I, I kind of knew it when I was younger, I knew at four years old, I was sitting in front of the TV, uh, watching the Dodgers play the, uh, Oakland athletics. And I don't know what it was, but it was kind of a calling. I just knew that, uh, that is what I wanted to do, which is strange for a four year old, right? We don't even know our name yet. And let alone, um, knowing that that's what I wanted to do. And my dad kind of saw it. My mom kind of saw that I was just glued to the TV. I would want him to record every single game. And so it was, I went off into little league. I, I played on five different teams at a time. And then I did really well in little league. And then I went into high school. I led the state of Florida in hitting and, uh, did well, went into college, um, passed on the draft in high school and then, you know, played college ball at a few different colleges and then ended up, um, getting a chance to play professionally, but you know, it wasn't without his challenges. I got hurt in college and had to go try out and earn my way on and walk on to a professional team. And fortunately was fortunate enough to play six years of professional ball. So it was a very, very long journey that I knew uh, deep in my soul that I wanted to do since I was four years old. So who was your favorite baseball team? Oh my goodness. So, um, it's always been the Dodgers, uh, to be true. Like it's all, it's always been the Dodgers since day one, since I was four years old. Um, and man, if we had our, you know, we won in like, I think it was like 1988, 89. And then we had a long drought there for a while, but yeah, fortunately we just won. So, um, you know, it's been kind of great, uh, but it's always been the Dodgers. Yeah. A, r- a rival of my Atlanta Braves. Oh, I like the Braves too. I used to play with Chipper Jones. Oh yeah. I love yeah. Chipper Jones. So if you would have if you would have uh, went into the draft in high school, what where what do you think you would have been drafted at, and what made you decide to pass up the draft? Well, um, the people that were in the running at the time that were looking at me were the Blue Jays and the Pittsburgh Pirates, and uh, they actually the Blue Jays ended up taking a guy named Felipe Lopez instead of me at the time. Um, him and I were kind of the one of the, top two of many prospects there in central Florida. And, um, they ended up going with him. I think he had a pretty decent, good career too. He went through the minor leagues, played some major, um, some seasons in the majors. And when that happened, that was like, the, it was, you know, they were looking at top two or three rounds and they ended up taking a position player early in the round. And so the position players that they would take went way later into the rounds that it just didn't seem worth it. Um, and so, I ended up passing on that and going into college and getting a full ride scholarship to a school in Tennessee because, um, you know, I think that kids and I I got asked this a lot after my career, which was like, you know, should I go pro or should I go to college? And the answer to that is, you know, I, I can't answer that in a general sense, but I can say that if, if you go later in the draft, there's less money invested in you. And if there's less money invested in you, there's less commitment. 
And so uh, if that, if that money isn't, doesn't exceed your opportunity that you think you'll have a good shot inside the minor leagues, it's always better to go get your education. You can always go back into the draft later. And so that's what I ended up doing. Well, what position did you play and and what team did you play on when you were in the MLB? Well, I never played MLB. I just played in the minor leagues, but I played uh, shortstop and second base my whole life. So I was a shortstop, um, you know, I came in and all through little league and then high school and then college. I had always played shortstop. It's interesting for your listeners is that um, what they might find interesting is that I was always told I couldn't do something right because I'm only five, nine. I'm 5'9", 160, 170 pounds. At the time, uh, you know, once I got the pro ball, I had beefed up and got to about 185, 190 pounds. But I was always told, you know, you're a good second baseman, but you'll never play shortstop at the professional level. First, it was college. You know, you're a good uh, college, you're a good high school shortstop, but you'll never be a college shortstop. But then I got to college and I was a shortstop. And then uh, they said, you know, you're a good uh, college shortstop, but you'll never play play pro ball because you don't have the arm for or the, or the quick release to be able to do it at shortstop. But then I played one gold gloves at shortstop at the pro level. So anybody who's ever being told you're too small, you're not good enough, you know, you're not strong enough, all these different things. I wouldn't listen to that stuff. It's not always true. So shortstop and second base mainly. Speaking of strong enough, you know, some people uh, cheat to get ahead or they get caught using uh, performance enhancing drugs. Oh yeah. What's your opinion on, on all that and all the people that have used them in the past and not made the hall of fame or something because of. Well, I'll speak directly to a few players on this. Um, but I can say that when I was coming up into the minor leagues, a large percentage of, of people were on steroids, uh, or performance tan engine drugs in some way, should perform, right? There's many different kinds of steroids. There's the anabolic steroids that you hear of. And those are the naughty ones that everybody's like, Oh, you shouldn't be doing that. Um, but then there's other ones like pro hormones and stuff like that, that are not steroids technically, but when you take them, the body triggers and turns it into steroids. So there's all these, there are all these, I mean, it was a big game and you've probably seen the Jose Canseco book and what it was like. And, you know, a lot of that's pretty accurate, man. I mean, a lot of those people were on steroids. So the question you have to ask yourself is, you know, how do you create a, the main argument against people like a Barry Bonds or, um, Jose Canseco or a Roger Clemens or whoever they were claiming was on him, Alex Rodriguez, right? Is that, oh, they had a unique advantage because they were on steroids. But how is that a unique advantage when, I don't know, 80% of them are, are doing it? So it actually seems like you're at a disadvantage if you don't do it. Um, so I, I don't think that keeping people out of the Hall of Fame for steroids is, I'm, I'm not a big fan of that. I think I'll give you an individual uh, case study. And that is Barry Bonds. I think Barry Bonds is the greatest hitter who's ever lived hands down. There's no, there's never been anybody as good of a complete hitter as Barry Bonds. Um, and to, to make the, um, make the, or or present the idea that Barry Bonds should not be in the hall of fame is in my opinion, not fair because the era in which he's playing is, you know, if you look at how hard people were throwing, it used to be, if you threw 90 miles an hour, you were like a phenom. There was nothing like you now as if you don't throw 90, you don't even, you don't even get a contract. Um, everybody throws 90. And so it was like, and there was that whole era of people were throwing a hundred, they were throwing even a hundred, 102, 103 miles an hour. And it was like, where is this coming from? Well, you know, there's a lot of things that have happened. Call it steroids, call it performance enhancing drugs, call it advanced workout routines, all that kind of stuff. So there was just, the game was just different than it was generations previously to that. Um, it doesn't mean that I condone steroids. I don't, but I think that taking away somebody's accomplishments in an arena where that was how the arena was, doesn't seem fair to me. And I still, to this day, I, I'll go on record and say, I think the Barry Bonds is the greatest hitter who's ever lived by far. Absolutely. He was definitely good. He definitely, we definitely had a problem with him when we were playing the Pittsburgh Pirates when he was playing. Oh yeah. And the Giants, right? The Dodge, us as the Dodgers, we had a hard time with that guy. Absolutely. So what, um, yeah. what, what um, made you let the listeners know what made you leave baseball and, and, you know, cause I know that was something that you really wanted to do. So what made you leave at such a young age? 
Yeah. At 27, it was a hard decision because I got offers to be hitting a hitting coach. I got offers to be, um, you know, an infield coach, all these different positions. And, um, you know, I still entertain the idea of being a performance coach for major league teams. You know, I've had some people kick around the idea and put out feelers of me being a mindset coach for certain teams and stuff like that. And I'd be open to that, but the big reason that I decided to leave, I had gotten injured. Um, first I tore my right bicep off my shoulder and then I tore my left bicep off my shoulder. And I kept going after that, by the way, curveball. I kept going. Um, and then I, uh, I tweaked my knee on a swing and it felt like there was a knife in my knee. And I just asked myself, you know, how beat up am I going to let my body get before I, before I call this quits. And in, in my last season, my second to last season, in the minor leagues, I had batted like th- high three hundreds. Like I was just killing it. And I didn't even get a sniff at going up or anything. And I thought to myself, well, if I, I did, that was the best I had. Like that was the best season I had. My average was off the charts. I had won a gold glove. Like, I don't know what else you want from me, but if that doesn't do it, I don't know what's going to do it. And then, um, I was playing for Gary Carter, who I believe has passed away from brain cancer, which was a shame. He was a great guy. I was playing for him and I tweaked my knee and I just, there's just too many injuries happening to where I just thought, you know what, I'm starting to creep up on 30. I've been out of the workforce for all of my life. Um, and if I'm not getting any, any progress moving forward, no matter how well I play, then it's probably going to be time to go. And that was devastating. You know, that, that literally quitting sent me into a major depression where I became suicidal. I, um, I was broke. I was sleeping on my parents' couch. Uh, my mom was making car payments for me. I wasn't, I wasn't exercising at all. I wasn't eating well. I was drinking. Um, it was, you know, I, which a lot of athletes, and I didn't know this at the time, but it's a, what a lot of athletes go through. And I had seen, you know, I went through about six months of that. And I started to see my other friends who had retired before me, or they were retiring shortly after me. And I noticed they were going through the same thing. And what I thought was, my love for this game is going to make me broke and alone if I don't pick myself up and reinvent myself. Um, and I remember talking to my brother and he said, you know, it's okay to do what you want to do until it's time to do what you got to do. And I just felt I, it was the hardest thing I've ever had to do in my life. I mean, even still to this day, as we're speaking right now, I, there's nights where I wake up in the middle of the night because I dream about playing baseball. I mean, it, it ripped my soul out to, to retire, but I knew I had to reinvent myself. I had to pick myself back up and I had to create a new life and I could take the things and the lessons that I had learned on the journey to be in pro ball, a pro ball player to, to build myself back up. And so I ended up, um, retiring from baseball, I started a baseball company called All Aspects Baseball, which was semi-successful for a first business. It was more of a practice than it was a business, but I was learning how, how business worked. And I got into real estate. I, I got into real estate a little bit and dived into that. And that was short-lived for a little bit because, you know, I, I while I was good at that, I come from a back, my, my family as all, you know, I come from a family of real estate, but um, it wasn't really my thing. And a buddy of mine, Matthew said, you know, you're in a career you hate and you're doing it for the money. You should, uh, you should go do something else. And so I did. And you know, the rest is history. But I think what your question was, is like, why did I, why did I retire? And why did I get out of it? Because I realized that, um, being attached to that game, um, sooner or later, uh, unless I was going to get lucky, but, you know, being a high performance coach for them or being a coach for them in general, right? Like, um, one of my coaches was Dirty Al Gallagher. He played uh, for the Angels and the Giants, and um, and he was an amazing coach. And he was coaching in the minors still. And it was like you know, people don't realize this. They see the coaches and the umpires. Those coaches and the umpires, curveball, are they're at the same level, right? They they are all doing the same thing. They're all trying to get to the major leagues. The coaches are trying to get there. The umpires are trying to get there. The radio broadcasters are trying to get there. Some of the the GMs for the minor league teams are trying to get there. Like it's all this big fight to get up to the top and it's a lottery ticket for all of them. Um, And so I was like, well, as a player, my road ended. Am I going to jump back into the coaching game and and go on bus trips and do all this? How long am I going to do that up into my 40s? And I saw people like that that would stick around the game into their 40s and they'd be broke. And um, 
And I just had to make a decision. And it was really, really, really hard. But ultimately, I knew I had something deep down, uh, more that I could give, more that I could contribute, more that I could build. And so that's ultimately what pulled me away from baseball. And it was a slow pull. It wasn't like one day I woke up and I was like, oh, I'm done. It was, it was, it was rough. <laughs> but yeah, that's why I decided to leave. So how influ influential were your parents on uh, encouraging you and, and working with you and, and helping you fulfill your dream of playing baseball uh, throughout your life and career? Yeah, you know, I don't think I could have asked for better parents. I My parents, um, you know, they they were super well off and then they went through hard times and my mom was working two jobs and my dad was working two jobs. Like it was, they're just trying to put food on the table, but I got to tell you, if I needed a bat, didn't matter how expensive it was. I got it. Didn't, if I needed a glove, it didn't matter how I got the glove I wanted, not the glove I needed. Um, I got the cleats I wanted. Like I never went without when it came to baseball now clothes and stuff. They were like, yeah, you don't need new shoes. But if I said need new cleats, they're like, no problem. So they were, they saw the talent that I had in baseball. They saw the drive that I had for baseball. And they literally put every resource, every, uh, all their emotions, all of their effort, all of their energy behind it. A hundred percent. I mean, I think at one point I was playing on five different teams at the same time in little league. They were just ridiculously supportive and bless their heart. They didn't know they were figuring it out as I was figuring out. They didn't know that. I mean, one of the things that we learned, uh, one of the best, best lessons or hardest lessons we learned in sports was that, you know, there's a lot of politics and you think, well, that's only in the major leagues. Oh no. It goes all the way down to little league. There's some hardcore politics. Parents are crazy. Um, and so they had to, they had to go to, there was one time where I almost got booted out of the little league because they said I was too cocky. <laughs> I was doing like somersault flips and throwing kids out. And because I see Ozzie Smith, right? And I was like, I'm going to be Ozzie Smith. And I would throw kids out. And they were like, this can't be tolerated. And so they had to go in front of the board and defend me. And I mean, that, that only happened once. But, uh, you know, they really put everything they had behind it. Even though they didn't have much to give, they gave everything they had. And that's a great thing as parents. That's what we all want to do for our kids. Now, oh, let's man. talk about... Um, you picking yourself up. What what did you do when you pick yourself up and, and what are you doing now um, to tell everybody yeah. about what you're doing now? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, what did I do to pick myself up? You know, um, I, I, if I said that I got over it, that wouldn't be true. I mean, I'm still not over it to this day. If it's, There's a lot of times I can't even watch baseball on TV because I'm just like, I know I could, I could, I could, I'm pretty sure I could pick up a bat and I could go compete right now. I wouldn't be one of the best, but I'm pretty sure I could compete. So it's tough to watch, but you know, I still have students and coaching clients that are in the major leagues. You know, I just got done watching Tyrone Taylor who plays for the Milwaukee Brewers. Um, I was coaching him since he was 10. He was facing, uh, um, why am I blanking on his name right now? Clayton Kershaw. And you, you get to see how nasty those dudes are. <laughs> you see them on TV and people are like, how come he's swinging right through it? I'm like, um, cause that sucker's going 92 with a movement. Okay. It's, it's, it's down the middle, but it's tough. So how did I pick myself up? I picked myself up just one step at a time. I, I didn't know what I was walking into. I didn't know the business arena. I just knew I wanted to make a lot of money. I wanted to make a, a life for, for myself. I wanted to build a family for myself. Um, I, I wanted to build, uh, something meaningful. I, I knew I, I didn't even know what it was at first, Curtis. Like, I didn't even know that, you know, I didn't know it was what I was going to be doing today, which is coaching, you know, business leaders and, uh, high profile athletes and all these kinds of things. I didn't know that that's what it was going to be. I, I, I had no idea. I actually dabbled in a bunch of different things. And I think that's part of the journey, right? The part of the journey is like, I'm going to go find a way. I'm going to go test things out. And so I tested out real estate and I tested out online marketing and I tested out all these different things. Um, and what I realized is you, you just kind of end up finding yourself. And I found myself as a coach. I, I naturally could get people to get results whether that was teaching somebody how to add a baseball, which, whether it was teaching a coach how to run their team, whether it was teaching somebody how to make more sales in their business. I've just always been really good at coaching and teaching 
um, for some reason. Uh, I've, I've been very good at simplifying things, but that took a long time. So I guess the way that I picked myself up is I just one day at a time, I just began to commit to finding another way. And that started as an online business. Then it went into real estate. Then I started working for a big time coaching company down in Orange County and ended up becoming a top speaker and coach for them. And the destiny just kind of unfolded. Um, I will say this for your listeners is that through that tough journey of reinventing myself, there were many days where I had to continue in the face of what appeared to be no results. I had to keep moving forward with blind faith in the faith in the face of what appeared to be no results. Like I would, you know, Monday I'd get up, I'd do my thing, fail. Tuesday, fail. Wednesday, fail. Thursday, fail. Friday, fail. And it turned out that business and sales is exactly like baseball. You get out like seven or eight out of 10 times. <laughs> but if you do that, you can build a career off of that. So the way that I picked myself up uh, was one, I just did it one day at a time. But the other one is I ran into a buddy of mine named Matthew Ferry, and he he helped me a lot. He helped show me um, you know, what it meant to reinvent myself and who I really was. And I just had great mentors. I had Matthew Ferry. I had my brother, John Kesey. Um, I had a wonderful mentor by the name of Steve Belmonte, who all, all these mentors of mine really uh, were the contributing factor. I don't think anybody succeeds on an island. I think everybody needs needs mentors. And I can honestly say it came down to two things. I guess if I were going to summarize it, number one is the commitment to find a way no matter what and never quitting and continuing in the face of what appears to be no results. And then running into and learning from the right mentors. Well, I know Matthew is a great person and I appreciate him for making this interview possible. Oh, yeah. What, what um, let's see, what, what, um, do you, what are some of the highest, uh, profile business and, uh, athletes that you've worked with? Cause I know you've worked with the military and, but what are some of the mm -hmm. high profile people that people are recognized? Yeah. So some of the elite U S Marines that, uh, are in the presidential, uh, sector, right. They're guarding the president, the president's cabinet and stuff like that. Uh, their mindsets are critical. Um, some elite business owners that are running, you know, $60 million companies, um, uh, major league athletes like Tyrone, um, Trevor Brown, like uh, they're, you know, catcher for the San Francisco, San Francisco giants, some former professional, uh, MMA fighters, um, who are also investors and authors and those kinds of things. So anybody who is a, a high profile, um, go getter elite. I, I realized that in that upper echelon of achievement, those people don't have a lot of people to connect with that get them, that understand what it's like to achieve at that level. Um, the pressure that that's there day in and day out. And um, I've been blessed that I didn't even, I didn't even try honestly, Kurt, I didn't, I didn't, it's almost like that niche, if you want to call it that chose me, I didn't choose it. In fact, uh, Matthew and, and his wife, Kristen were some of the ones that were like, you need to stop coaching the people that you're coaching and you need to coach this type of person. And that type of person just showed up in my life. Um, and it turns out, I just, I get how they think. I'm probably from years of playing pro ball and um, being a business owner and leader myself. Um, so that, that's kind of the areas that I've been working with. Anybody who needs to perform at a high level and produce and have a strong mindset and, and perform is usually the people that I work well with. Tell everybody about your podcast. Uh, what made you want to start that? How long it's been going? And, and what, what is the topic of the podcast? Oh, okay. Yeah. The podcast is called Find A Way. And um, the podcast is basically, so there's two parts to that podcast. One part is me telling you the life lessons that I've learned. Um, you know, and I, I try to keep them uh, as uh, distinct as possible, right? Like I'm, like I'm noticing the way that you run your podcast is very, um, it's very unconventional, which I love, uh, you know, because everybody's copying everybody out there. And um, it's one of the things I appreciate about your podcast with my podcast. I basically, it's very much my life lessons. I'm the Guinea pig. I, I'm not going to teach you stuff that I Googled or that I YouTubed. I'm going to teach you stuff that I experienced, whether that's in my relationships, whether that's my health, 
whether that's my productivity, my mindset, my skill sets, my influence and persuasion, whatever that might be, my leadership, I there's this I'm just documenting what I experience and how I find a way to win. Um, that's always kind of been the skill that I've I've noticed that I've had is just no matter how high the odds are stacked, I seem to be able to, and I probably get this from my older brother and my mother, is that I always have a knack for finding a way to win. Um, and so as I come up against challenges on my podcast, I'm talking about how I'm doing it. And sometimes I don't. Sometimes I'm like, man, this thing's kicking my butt. Um, but when I learn these life revelations and these life lessons, I, I share that. But then the other thing that I like to share is um, client testimonials and stories about what they've been going through and just open up the listeners to, you know, it's not just me. It's not just David. Listen to what David has to say. It's um, look at what these other people are doing that success leaves clues. And there's some common themes that if you'll, you'll follow them, uh, you know, I think it, I'm, my hope, my intention is that it gives people the inspiration to find a way, even if they're struggling with things. And that's what my podcast is all about, doc, having guests on to document their stories so they can hopefully help and encourage somebody else. Yeah, what you're doing is great, man. Are there any other projects that your company is working on? Are you working on any books or any other upcoming things that listeners need to know about? Yeah, I've got a book coming up. You plugged that perfectly. I don't even know if you knew it, but I've got a book coming up. Um, it's called Find a Way, and um, it's High Performance Secrets for Winning Inside Business and Life. It's called Find a Way. It should be out in 2021, um, which is in a, in a month, maybe two max. Um, and if they want to get that book, they can go to davidkesey.com, david, K-E-E-S-E-E.com, uh, and they can go pre-order it, or they can wait till it's out, and then they can order it that way. Absolutely. And uh, what kind of give an overview of what the book's going to be about, you know, kind of like a little trailer or something. Yeah, I'll give you a trailer. So inside that book, you get to hear a few things. You get to hear from my major league clients. You get to hear from my professional MMA fighter clients, from my uh, Marine clients. You get to hear from these people and get some insight from them. And then also I tell you the journey. So some of the things that you, you've you asked me about here, I go into more detail about it, about how I actually became a professional baseball player. I talk about a near-death experience when I, I died when I was eight years old, which we haven't covered, but I died when I was eight years old. And so I tell, talk about that story and how that's impacted my entire life. And then the rest of the book is about giving the reader the perspectives, the mindset principles and tools and strategies that I've learned along the way that separate the elite from the rest. And so my intention is to basically make it a, a Bible for those who, for people who compete and want to win inside their business, their sport, inside their life. Um, if they've got goals that they want to achieve, that book will help them do it. Now, would you like to cover that near-death experience here? Would you like to just leave it as a teaser for the book? I'm going to leave it as a teaser for the book because it's kind of a long story. Um, but I, I will say that, um, you know, my intention is, you know, if, if you can find a way through that, just to let people know, if you can find a way through that, you can pretty much find a way through anything. Perfect. Is there any I'd, like to, I'd like to hear a little bit more about you and, and what you... Um, what, what your podcast and what you're committed to and all that kind of stuff. Well, basically what I'm committed to is interviewing guests that can motivate and inspire. Sometimes we mm -hmm. just need that extra push. If, if we are uh, kind of having self doubt or fear or worrying about what our critics might think, and you never know the reason I started this podcast and while I'm doing it today is because of somebody encouraging me and keeping it on my mind saying, Hey, you ought to do it after I, graduated broadcasting school and you know it just took those words of encouragement instead of always thinking well who's gonna listen to me who am I gonna get on the show yeah so I like to interview guests that can motivate and inspire and tell their story from all walks of life some are famous some are starting their own podcast some mm -hmm. are authors just getting started but just giving people that encouragement I've even had people on that have survived suicide or a suicide attempt and uh, you never know when you'll you'll uh, save somebody's life or stop them from going down the same road and um, even when I interviewed Matthew you know uh, when he was talking about all that he was doing and he even 
perform live on the show. I got him to perform live. <laughs> that's awesome. So I interview all kind of guests mm -hmm. that motivate and inspire. Yeah, that's great. Wow, that's amazing. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So be before we uh, go, uh, you got any questions for me? If not, do you have any other topics that um, we haven't talked about that you would like to leave the listeners with? You know, I think you, uh, and I was wondering why you were so good at this. Now, now I know your background, it makes sense. Uh, you covered all the basis, man. You really did a really good job. And I just recommend that anybody listen to this podcast that you subscribe and keep listening because um, what you're doing, man, is really, it's really special. So I appreciate you having me on and I appreciate what you're doing for everybody. Oh, anytime. It was my honor. Ladies and gentlemen, David Kesey. David, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. And listeners, like you said, please rate, review, and subscribe after hearing the show. For more information on the Living the Dream podcast, visit www.djcurveball.com. Until next time, stay focused on living the dream.